During the mid-1960s, Beijing was ablaze as the Great Cultural Revolution raged through the city. The Young Red Guards had burned over two million books and were beating and banishing people for the crime of being wealthy and knowledgeable. Mao Zedong had called for cleansing China of anything and anyone that was against his ideology. Even the middle class were not safe. But then the Red Guards turned on an old gardener living under Mao's protection. What did China's youth have against this poor old man? What dirty secret about China was this old man hiding? How was he related to the 2,000-year history of China? Welcome to Nutty History. Today, we are opening the historical chapter about the untold story of the last emperor of China. China's Most Wanted Old Man During the late 1950s, Mao pushed his biggest ambition yet all over China called the Great Leap Forward. This was an attempt to modernize the country's agricultural sector using communist economic ideologies. However, things did not go as planned and nearly 50 million Chinese died thanks to the famine that followed. It was possibly the largest agricultural catastrophe in human history. As his political party turned on him and tried to replace Mao Zedong in an attempt to hold on to power, he rallied China's youth against the elite and the rich. People lost their lives, loved ones, and their homes. Another million or two succumbed to the acts of dystopian authoritarianism, along with the loss of valuables worth $44.8 million in gold, paintings, furniture, and other forms of art, jewelry, etc. The Red Guards also immolated 2.3 million books and destroyed 4,922 of the 6,843 officially designated places of culture or historical interest in Beijing. Students were dragging their teachers and professors of Western education to the streets for a beating. They invaded and ransacked 114,000 homes and uprooted nearly 77,000 lives. They were directed to root out those who were not sufficiently revolutionary and those who were considered bourgeois. Even those who were members of the CCP were not safe, especially if they were voicing against Mao's policies. Of course, I joined. It's uh, glorious to join here. Yeah. I was uh, totally uh, pour my energy, even my life, into it to support whatever Mao asked me to do. This is when an old, slim man working as the editor of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference became a target of the Red Guards. Before being appointed as the editor by Mao's government, the nearly 60-year-old man had only worked as a gardener and a mechanic in his entire life. So why exactly was the subject of the Red Guard's ire, you ask? Well, because this man was also the last remnant of the Chinese imperial era that lasted 2,000 years. Henry Puyi, also known as Xiang Tong Puyi, the last emperor of China, was coronated and then had to abdicate the throne, not once or twice, but three times. Fortunately for him, the Red Guards were unsuccessful in demolishing the eventual symbol of old China as CCP acted fast and placed him under protective custody. Coincidentally, this was the third time he will be put into guardianship and also the last time. The Cultural Revolution would last another 10 years in China, but Puyi's kidney gave up in 1967. And just like that, the 2,000 years of glorious history of Imperial China came to an end with silence. There wasn't a lot to talk about concerning Puyi's death but there was a lot to talk about concerning his life. Born in 1906, the former regent lived a life as eventful and tumultuous as the first half of the 20th century. He lived through the fall of his empire, the Second Sino-Japanese War, World War II, the Chinese Civil War, and the founding of Mao's China. It was a heck of a journey, from birth in a life of unimaginable privilege to death as a humble assistant gardener who sang praises about Mao and his political ideology. The Toy Emperor after the death of his uncle Guangxu, Empress Dowager Cixi appointed Puyi as the heir to the throne. Cixi wanted to stay in power, and by choosing a toddler as the next emperor, she could pull the strings from behind the scenes. But as fate would have it, Cixi passed away a day before Puyi's ascension to the throne. The child emperor spent the next four years in the Forbidden City, cut off from his birth family and surrounded by a host of eunuchs who had to obey his every childish whim. When the little boy discovered that he had that power, he would order the eunuchs to be strapped if they displeased him in any way. Now, the only person who dared discipline the tiny tyrant was his wet nurse and substitute mother, Wen Chao Wang. 
But before Puyi could grow enough to understand the importance of his duties, his own prime minister, Yuan Shikai, used a rebellion to overthrow the Qing dynasty and became the first president of the People's Republic of China. Dowager Empress Longyu was offered 1,700 pounds of silver and amnesty to stamp the edict of the abdication of the emperor. Puyi remained in the forbidden city and the child had no idea he was no longer the emperor, but everybody in the palace pretended. He was allowed to keep his title and mock imperial state, attended by courtiers and eunuchs, served meals of 40 courses, and given playmates who were punished if Puyi misbehaved. At first, Yuan tried to be the champion of democracy, but when people's will conflicted with his ambitions, Yuan cracked down on elected members of the parliament. Soon, he declared himself the new emperor of China, but once again fate intervened and Yuan died before his enthronement. Puyi became emperor once more with the support of a warlord named Xing Shun, but this was a short reign of only 11 days. Eventually, in 1924, the 18-year-old former emperor was forced to leave the Forbidden City. The Japanese Puppet Expelled from his paternal palace, Puyi found refuge in the Japanese embassy at first, and later moved to Tianjin, which was controlled by Japan. In 1931, Puyi asked for aid from the Japanese Minister of War to recover his throne by birthright. Japan was already looking for an excuse to invade China and expand its imperialistic influence, so this gave them the perfect opportunity to occupy Manchuria. Manchuria was the homeland of Puyi's ancestors, and though he was not pleased about ruling only a part of China when he was promised the entire country, still, he accepted. They say the third time's a charm, but for Puyi, there was no such case. He was still just a face on the throne with no real power, as was the case the first two times. This time, his strings were in the hands of the Japanese emperor. Between 1935 and 1945, Puyi allowed Japanese forces to conduct ghastly experiments on nearly 12,000 men, women, and children in POW camps set up by the infamous Unit 731. He turned a blind eye to the Japanese army, using grisly armaments in China that were stored and authorized in Manchukuo, which led to more than 200,000 deaths. The forced labor in Japanese POW camps also caused numerous deaths as 10 million Chinese civilians were mobilized to Manchukuo. How the Mighty Fell Puyi's reign as regent was officially over with the conclusion of the war to end all battles. The USA dropped the big one on Nagasaki on the day the Soviet Union invaded Manchukuo. Despite the fact that Japan gave up on August 15th, the battle in Manchukuo continued for nearly a week and Puyi was caught while trying to escape Japan. Instead, the Russians sent him to Siberia. Puyi was certain that this was the end of the road for him and that he would be terminated, but he was taken to Chita, where he was treated like an ambassador and lived a life of relative comfort. Living there, Puyi got acclimatized to the Russian lifestyle and was fed three square meals a day along with afternoon tea. There were attendants, doctors, and nurses to look after him, and he was given books, board games, and a radio to stay occupied. Puyi was dreaming of a move to the U.S. or Great Britain and live a lavish life as an exile with the help of millions of dollars worth of jewelry and art pieces he still had in his possession. However, the relationship between the USSR and other allied nations soured rapidly after the end of the Second War. So, the USSR had no intentions of giving up their prized prisoner to their friends turned rivals. Instead, they were watching patiently for the outcome of the power conflict between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong in China. However, one thing was certain. No matter which side would have won, they both wanted Puyi back for the same reason, to hang him on the gallows. Puyi begged the Soviet Union to let him stay permanently in Russia in return for testifying against the Japanese government at the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. Puyi was careful not to confess his guilt. The Soviets ignored his pleas and sent him to Khabarovsk, where he was treated like no king and there were fewer privileges. Yet he still had a comfortable life. This is when Puyi developed a green thumb and began gardening in an empty lot of land provided to him along with the residents. Exactly five years after being captured in August of 1950, Puyi was sent back to China after Mao's decisive victory. However, he wasn't to be terminated, but imprisoned. There, he learned what real prison life was like. No longer an emperor, Puyi was incarcerated at the Fushun War Criminals Management Center in Laoning Province and had to be reformed under the re-education program for political prisoners. There are not sufficient records of what he endured during imprisonment. Apart from the fact that Puyi wrote his autobiography there and when he was granted amnesty by Mao Zedong in 1959, he became a vocal advocate of Mao's policy. You can wonder why. 
We hope you enjoyed this video and do not forget to like and share. Subscribe to our channel and ring the bell for more nutty history. Thanks for watching.